On a crisp Saturday morning in Sydney South, a group of bikers is preparing for a ride. They're members of a pro-Russia club called the Night Wolves. Their nickname is Putin's Angels. We join because of the bike, so obviously you can't join the club unless you're on the bike. That's the first thing. We all got common interests. So we don't do drugs, we don't do weapons, we don't do any of that stuff. We just want to show the world or the Russia or whatever, whatever you want to call it that Russia had a massive history and we're trying to keep it up. The Night Wolves are among an international network of patriots determined to remind the world that Vladimir Putin's Russia is a force to be reckoned with. Putin sees such organizations as a significant asset in pursuing his particular goals, whether they be domestic goals or foreign policy goals. You can use the Russian diaspora, the Russian community, to seek to build your influence and then use that influence, it is to be hoped, to shift Australia's policies. Russia makes no bones about it. In Russia, Putin has launched a brutal crackdown to crush pro-democracy protesters. While in Australia, his supporters are determined to shout down Putin's critics. We're here with our president Vladimir Putin, supporting the president, supporting Vladimir Putin against this opposition scum. Why would Russia care about Australia? Russia cares about Australia because Russia cares about everywhere. The fact of the matter is that Russia is aware of what's going on in Australia and certainly does not regard it as insignificant. Australia has also become a safe haven for rivers of dirty money flowing out of Putin's corrupt regime. Australia is a great place to keep money. It's a democracy with a stable banking system and criminals love democracies with stable banking systems. This is why Australia is a great destination for illicit funds. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate Russian money and influence in Australia. We track the tainted cash from Russian criminals and politicians that has washed up on our shore. We reveal how one of Putin's closest allies lobbied Australia to help lift US sanctions from his business interests and how a propaganda war is being waged right here to support the Kremlin's global agenda. The New South Wales chapter of the Night Wolves is putting on a proud show of Russian patriotism. They're heading for a cenotaph on Sydney's northern beaches to celebrate a famous Russian battle known as the Attack of the Dead. Night Wolves is a patriotic club, patriotic club, and we do как бы мероприятия, посвященные памяти, памяти Первой мировой войны, Второй мировой войны, погибшим всех в этих войнах. И, в общем-то, это, это нас и объединяет. The Night Wolves are probably the most well-organized and best-branded Russian bike organization. The current strength of the organization is about 5,000 active members. It has chapters all across Russia, but also spreading into the former Soviet space, as well as into uh, Europe, uh, as well as other parts of the world, which now includes Australia. Yeah. 
the Australian chapter was founded in 2015. There are now members in New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and Western Australia. Uh, boys, gather round. Publicly, they're doing a whole range of activities uh, from organizing Christmas shows for disadvantaged children to joy bike rides to uh, what they describe as patriotic rights um, normally associated with commemorating um, major historical milestones. But more recently, certainly over the past seven or eight years, they began really positioning themselves um, as, as, as public supporters of, of the current course of the Russian government. The club's most famous supporter is Vladimir Putin. The Russian night wolves act as a proxy army for the Kremlin. They promote their expertise in military and combat tactics. The Night Wolves are sanctioned by the United States for fighting with the pro-Russian forces in Ukraine. The Kremlin has this concept of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world. Essentially, wherever there are ethnic Russians, then Moscow needs to have some kind of representation. And so what we tend to find is wherever you have any kind of flows of, of Russians, whether individuals or, or rich Russians, then with them move a whole variety of different organisations. Although on the whole this is meant to be essentially a simply an expression of cultural identity more than anything else, it doesn't mean that it cannot then be activated at some point to precisely be used for some kind of influence operation or similar. The shores of Sydney Harbour seem an unlikely setting for a celebration of Russian nationalism. Today's event is organised by a pro-Putin group called the Double-Headed Eagle Society. <laughs> Among the guests is the Russian Consul General in Sydney. In about three minutes, if you come and please take your seats. The host is 31-year-old Sydney cider Simeon Boykov, the Australian-born son of a Russian Orthodox priest. He is also the leader of the Australian Cossack Society, which styles itself as a military unit. Today's ceremony uh, is very significant. because It's the 100th anniversary since uh, the 1920 uh, Great Russian Exodus. What are the Cossacks in Australia here to do and to achieve? The purpose of the Cossacks in Australia is to preserve Cossack traditions, culture, values, and also to promote pro-Russian sentiment. And I've been accused of that, but I'll say it on camera. We have no problems of admitting that we are pro-Russian. Boykov leads a small group of dedicated Australian Cossacks. Oikov's leadership has been controversial. At this meeting, filmed by the Cossacks and posted on YouTube, he is reappointed for five years after fighting off an attempt to remove him. So our job as Russian patriots, and this is what I call upon my compatriots to do all the time, is to, to be mobilized and be active in defending Russia. Some people, they think, oh, well, you know, assimilation and so forth, and we can't do much to help Russia. We believe that it's not enough just to be Russian. 
You must support Russia. You must actively support Russia, and you should defend Russia. Boykov has led groups of Australian Cossacks to Russia, where they fired guns and visited a military training facility. In 2018, Simeon Boykov told a Russian media outlet, we have a unique opportunity to support Russia from within an enemy state. He was referring to Australia. He said Cossacks in Australia could pursue a pro-Russian position, lobby politicians and members of parliament, oppose anyone who lies about Russia, attacks Russia or imposes sanctions. Basically, they can wage an information war. Why do you regard Australia as an enemy state? No, Australia in this context, a state which is placing sanctions against Russia and behaving in an anti-Russian manner, um, you know, in that way it could be perceived uh, that the activities are not the activities of an ally. The main thing to know is we're not against Australia at all. We love Australia. We will defend Australia and we'll try to defend it. And we want to facilitate the rehabilitation of Australian relations with Russia which is very important. Australia's relationship with Russia collapsed in 2014 after the Russian military incursion into Ukraine. Pro-Russian separatists shot down Malaysia Airlines flight MH17, killing 283 passengers. 38 were Australians. Uh, look, I'm going to uh, shirt front, Mr Putin. Uh, you bet you are. Uh, you bet I am. Uh, I am going to uh, be saying to Mr Putin, um, Australians were murdered. Uh, they were murdered by Russian-backed rebels using Russian-supplied equipment. Uh, we are very unhappy about this. I mean, up to this point, Russian-Australian relations had very much been about trade and cultural contact. Suddenly, it became much, much more conflictual, and suddenly we had the Australian uh, Sort of very much pushing for independent investigations, for justice to, to be done. And that made, in a way, Australia a problem for the Kremlin. And the Kremlin's natural response is, when it sees a problem, it makes problems back in return. When protesters condemned Putin over MH17 during the 2014 G20 meeting in Brisbane, Australian Cossack Simeon Boykov led a counter-rally defending the Russian president. Four Corners has learned Australian authorities were monitoring Boykov over concerns he may have raised money for separatists in Ukraine and may have travelled to the conflict himself. Do you deny it? Of course I deny travelling to Ukraine. I haven't been to Ukraine uh, since the beginning of the war. I went to Ukraine before the war. I've been to Western Ukraine, Kiev. In 2015, Boykov went to Russia to meet a notorious military separatist leader blamed for MH17 known as Strelkov. At this time, Strelkov was being accused of direct involvement in the downing of MH17. Why did you think it was appropriate to go and visit him? Igor Strelkov is a hero of Novorossiya, Novorussia. He didn't uh, shoot down MH17, neither did anyone on the Russian side. MH17 was shot down by Ukraine. 
over Ukrainian territory, uh, you know, uh, in Ukrainian airspace. It had nothing to do with Russia. Very simple. Boykov's denial of Russia's guilt ignores the overwhelming evidence. In fact, Strelkov and three others, two Russians, one Ukrainian, are currently on trial in the Netherlands for this very crime. In absentia. Uh, well, uh, you know, they can, they can make whatever kangaroo court they like, but, you know, um, you know, if we shot the plane down, I'm sure we would have admitted it. Boykov and his fellow Cossacks have also tried to silence the local Ukrainian community. In this video, Boykov taunts parishioners and their priest outside a Ukrainian church in Sydney. I want to ask you a question. Why do you have a Crimea is Ukrainian in your church? Everyone knows it's Russian. Everyone knows it's Russian. It was, it will be, it will be. Also present is Vladimir Simonian, the president of the Night Wolves Australia Motorcycle Club. Some would see that as intimidation. Oh, well, there's a fine line. I mean, if we wanted to, we could have done something much worse. But we wouldn't do that because we don't promote breaking the law, we don't promote radicalism, we don't promote. Uh, anything like that, you know, that's un-Australian and... Uh, uh, but it's good to remind uh, other people, uh, in our presence, our physical presence, just, uh, uh, you know, people seeing that the fact that there are Cossacks and so forth, is enough to discourage anti-Russian activities, and I've, I've noticed that. Boykov spreads his relentlessly pro-Russian views in the newspaper he founded called Russian Frontier. The Russian Frontier newspaper in Australia is a newspaper which uh, counters the anti-Russian hysteria. You know, people read the newspaper and they're shocked to realise, oh, isn't, that that's a different side to the story, you know. The Western press is very anti-Russian, so this is a good alternative. Putin has a lot of power in the Kremlin. The Russian government has a lot of power and has a very large armed forces. But they can't do certain things which we can help them do. Which is explained, for example, to local people in the West uh, that Russia, you know, is not involved in hacking. Russia didn't poison these people. Russia didn't shoot down this plane. Russia didn't, you know, everything that they accuse us of constantly. Russian Frontier doesn't just deliver pro-Russian news. It's also used to settle scores. Last year, former Australian diplomat and Russia intelligence analyst Kyle Wilson became a target of Russian Frontier. Its content tends to be extremist. It makes a practice of identifying people who disagree with it as enemies. It calls them enemies of Russia. Wilson had written about Boykov's pro-Russian influence activities in Australia, infuriating Boykov. The next edition of Russian Frontier branded Wilson's article racist and called him an anti-Russian conspiracy theorist. In a video posted to social media, Boykov joked about a meme he'd published of Putin with the line, funny guy, I kill you last, next to a photo of Wilson. Funny guy, I kill you last. I hope we don't arrest us for this number. The abuse, uh, the vituperation, the questioning of my motives, the impugning of my integrity by implying that I had been commissioned to write the article and had been paid by someone. 
Well, these are familiar tactics. As you know, protesters in Russia, who were sometimes set upon by Cossacks um, with their whips. I'm not going to tolerate people like Kyle Wilson bashing our community, you know, writing hysterical articles against Russia. Well, you know, we have a newspaper and we'll use that to defend Russian interests and to um, publicly criticize and rebuff the outrageous allegations that Kyle Wilson makes. Simeon Boykov's partner in the newspaper is Russian national Valery Malinovsky. Malinovsky is also the chairman of the Australian branch of the Double-Headed Eagle Society, a pro-Putin Russian nationalist group. Boykov is his deputy. The agenda of our branch is to promote Russian culture, to educate people, to disseminate this uh, misconception about Russia. 30 million Russians uh, live overseas. It's 20% uh, of the whole population. And uh, if somehow we can talk to them, um, educate them again, to promote our culture, it will be very valuable for the country. So the Two-Headed Eagle Society, we are told, is also about the propagation of Russian values, but it's particularly about re-educating Russians abroad so that they have what they call the correct view of Russian history. That is, writing the wrong, which is the distortion of Russian history, outside Russia, but also inside Russia. Last year, Boykov and Malinovsky were appointed to their positions by the then head of the Double-Headed Eagle Society in Russia, Leonid Reshetnikov, a former Russian spy. Reshetnikov and the Russian branch of the society have been accused of involvement in espionage activities in Eastern Europe. Now, Leonid Reshetnikov was a general in the KGB. He's now purported to be retired, but Mr. Putin has said that there's no such thing as a retired KGB officer. Now, that's the context, it seems to me, in which one should view what we're seeing in Australia, the prosecution of that information war in Australia, clearly designed to try to get the Australian government to change its policies uh, towards reforming those policies so that they would be perceived as serving Russia's interests and not being hostile to Russia. We need to recognize that Russia doesn't look at Australia as, as a friendly country. Russia looks at Australia through, uh, through the prism of our security and defense alliance with the United States. By ignoring Russia's weight, Russia's influence and Russia's international status, we allow ourselves to be caught off guard every time Russia can pull the card out of its sleeve and wants to play uh, a game against uh, Australia. Russia's interest in Australia is not just political. Australia has become an attractive destination for large sums of Russian cash. Four Corners has been working with international anti-corruption organisations to investigate millions of dollars in allegedly dirty Russian money stashed here and laundered through Australian banks and businesses. Australia is a great place to keep money. It's a democracy with a stable banking system and criminals love democracies with stable banking systems. This is why Australia is a great destination for illicit funds. Paul Radju is the co-founder of the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, a group of investigators based in Eastern Europe. In 2014, his organisation used an enormous leak of banking and company records to expose one of the largest ever global money laundering schemes. They dubbed it the Russian laundromat. In the case of the Russian laundromat, more than 20 billion US dollars left Russia, entered bank accounts in one bank in the Republic of Moldova, and from these bank accounts in the Republic of Moldova, they went sideways. They went 
most of the money went to a bank in the European Union, in Latvia, called Trasta Commerzbanka, and from there, through some of the world's largest banks, ended up everywhere, including in Australia. The leak revealed that some of that money was funneled to a company based in the tiny New South Wales coastal town of Umina Beach. This is the headquarters of Gemini Packaging, a business established by a Russian-born businesswoman to sell food and drink containers to Russia, Moldova and other countries. The leaked documents show Gemini Packaging received more than three quarters of a million dollars from one bank and two shell companies central to the Russian laundromat scheme. The payments were listed as being for construction materials. But when we asked Gemini's Australian director about the data, she said she didn't recognise the company names and had no record of the transactions. Quite a few of the companies that we spoke with said the same, that they were not aware of the origin of the money, that they, they didn't know who was making the payment. And in fact, what we've seen is that sometimes they contracted services but then the money would be paid by these offshore type of companies. At the receiving end, the company said, well, we don't know why they chose to pay us in that particular way. there is an estimated $1 trillion in dark Russian money hidden offshore. Part of Ilya Shumanov's job at Transparency International is to track it down. Four Corners has been working with him to investigate the flow of some of this tainted cash into Australia. A thousand Russian officials and oligarchs, uh, they kept their money not in Russia but abroad for the safe reasons, because uh, they are not sure about the stability of Russian political and economical system. That's why they would like to uh, save their money in some financial sectors, uh, not in Russia but in other territories. On March 5, 2013, five Russians flew into Brisbane Airport. They said they were here for a holiday. They were part of a larger group of nine Russians who had made multiple visits to Queensland since 2010. These guys who came to Australia a few times they're not very high rank Russian businessmen, yeah? Uh, it looks like that they have some businesses in Russia, but it's not big business, let's say. The Russians were involved in two Siberian businesses, an ice cream factory and a precious gem company. During their visits, they opened 24 accounts at this one surface paradise branch. And over three years, more than $29 million was deposited into them. The Russians obtained debit cards on those bank accounts, and they used those debit cards to fund uh, luxury holidays, designer clothes, uh, expensive jewellery. The Australian Federal Police carried out a six-month investigation, and with the material they had, they sought successfully to freeze those bank accounts um, in Queensland. In court, the Australian Federal Police said they believed the cash was the proceeds of crime, and the accounts were being used as virtual piggy banks for very large amounts of money. A judge said the police evidence showed a very clear inference of money laundering by the Russians. The Russian media uh, asked these guys about the purpose of their visit to Australia and they answered that they 
uh, would like to provide some uh, so sources for dairy uh, goods for, for ice cream factory. And also, they would like to start the jam business with uh, some Australian partners. But they have never opened uh, any uh, corporate in Australia. Uh, they only deposited this money on the, into the bank accounts, and nothing else. The case was shrouded in secrecy after the court agreed to extraordinary suppression orders over most of the evidence. Now, the normal case is that the court suppresses court documents because they're concerned that that may affect the integrity of a jury trial in order to protect an accused from unfair prejudicial information. Now, that's not the situation here because there's no prospect of a criminal trial. So other reasons for uh, issuing suppression orders include safeguarding national security or protecting Australia's relations with foreign countries. Our joint investigation led to the Siberian city of Irkutsk. We uncovered new information linking the gem company at the centre of the alleged scheme with a powerful figure in the Putin government. Documents show it is part owned by the son of Russia's Deputy Prosecutor General, Alexei Zakharov. Alexei Zakharov, he is uh, well known uh, in Russia. He's a very, very powerful person with a big connection in the Ministry of Defense of Russia, advisor of Mr. Putin and so on and so on. Zakharov's son, Dmitry, became a shareholder in the gem company in 2015. He is a big fan of the luxury cars, and he spent a lot of time in social media and playing uh, video games and so on and so on. And I think so, uh, he barely had an opportunity to visit Irkutsk. And I think so, this guy could be, uh, could be the nominee of his father or his family. The Australian authorities should really focus on this type of criminal behavior, on this, because this is a pattern. You know, offshore type of companies, shell companies, wiring money into bank accounts in Australia. We've only seen the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more going on, and this is very, very worrying. It's not just criminals and politicians allegedly hiding dark money offshore. Some of Russia's most prominent business figures are accused of moving their dirty cash around the globe. One is an oligarch named Oleg Deripaska, who has a significant investment in Australia. Oleg Deripaska is a billionaire tycoon who made his fortune during a violent power struggle to take over Russia's lucrative aluminium industry. It was a time of extraordinary notoriety of, of gangsters being used as hitmen as part of, of business disputes and so forth. Deripaska was not, shall we say, regarded as the dirtiest of those. But nonetheless, that's the environment in which he was operating. And so we've got allegations of people being threatened or actually thrown out of helicopters. We have allegations of being in bed with gangsters, using them not just to pay them off for protection, but actually using them to target business rivals. We have allegations of moving dirty money and essentially laundering it through, it, through this sector. Now, it's important to stress, these have not been proven in a court of law. What I heard was, in terms of Oleg, he would come out of the hotel and there were six Mercedes lined up, black Mercedes. He would go in one of them and they would drive as a convoy out to the, uh, the smelter. And all the things behind that was because uh, people were trying to kill him uh, over the aluminium assets. And they had to lock themselves in the smelter one day when they were under, literally under fire. And his CFO was killed. Um, he was shot. Uh, in this war.
Deripaska's company, Rusal, became one of the largest aluminium producers in the world. In 2004, Rusal invested in Australia, buying 20% of Queensland Alumina Limited for $530 million and partnering with mining giant Rio Tinto, which owns the remaining 80%. The Australian refinery remains an important asset for Rusal. They needed four million plus tonnes of alumina and they didn't have it in their own empire. Um, and the quality of the material they made the um, alumina from wasn't as good as the fantastic bauxite we have here in Australia. Deripaska is one of Russia's most powerful oligarchs who owes his position to Vladimir Putin. He's accused by the US Treasury of holding assets and laundering money for the Russian president. Putin hasn't hesitated to publicly remind Deripaska who's boss. Putin essentially created a system in which he has compromising information on every Russian billionaire. Indeed, all of them earned their wealth in, in a slightly dubious way in the 90s when really all the rules went out of the window. And it became a system in which uh, sort of the Russian billionaires understood very clearly that they owned their assets uh, through remaining in the good books of the Kremlin, that they had to carry out strategic tasks for the Kremlin. In 2012, during a business dispute in the British High Court, allegations emerged that Deripaska had ordered the murder of a rival, bribed an official, and had Russian mafia links. He's also been accused by the US Senate Intelligence Committee of involvement in murderous political conspiracies on behalf of the Kremlin. According to the Senate Intelligence Report, uh, Deripaska wound up funding and uh, directly executing a Russian intelligence plan to overthrow uh, the pro-Western Montenegrin government and try and assassinate its prime minister. <laughs> so these are pretty stark accusations, which of course uh, Deripaska would deny, but the Senate Intelligence Committee obviously has enough evidence to, to make these allegations. In 2018, after allegations of Russian meddling in the US election, Deripaska was among the Putin loyalists hit with financial sanctions by the United States. Rusal and its parent company EN Plus were also targeted. Those sanctions prevented uh, financial transactions largely in the United States. He, as well as his companies, primarily under the umbrella of Rusal and EN Plus, were prevented from continuing to expand their businesses and exchange money in the United States. Deripaska hired top-tier Washington lobbyists Mercury Public Affairs to try to get the sanctions on Rusal and EN Plus overturned. Researcher Anna Masolia began tracking the operation. Mercury Public Affairs was able to leverage their connections in DC with people in political positions of power in order to further this foreign influence operation. One way that they did this was by contacting ambassadors in a number of countries, including Australia, to send letters that furthered the interest of the foreign influence operation. The lobbyists targeted the then Australian ambassador to Washington, Joe Hockey, to pressure him to support the lifting of sanctions. They sent him a briefing note warning, Rusal owns 20% of Queensland alumina. Therefore, the jobs and critical economic activity of this company are at risk. 
the letter that was sent to the Australian uh, ambassador to the US sought to provide assurances to the Australian ambassador that the company had sufficiently restructured to warrant those sanctions against them being lifted. And those assurances included, for example, that uh, Mr Deripaska had reduced his controlling ownership of Rusal to less than 50%, so he no longer held a controlling uh, share stake. The lobbyists prepared a draft letter they wanted Hockey to sign and deliver to key decision makers. It read, on behalf of the Commonwealth of Australia, I would like to express strong support for the plan to restructure the EN Group and Rusal in order to lift the threat of sanctions against the companies. It is quite extraordinary that a lobbyist would actually provide a letter um, stating we, the Commonwealth of Australia, support this uh, request. Uh, it is quite a, an audacious uh, approach to lobbying and is effectively spoon-feeding uh, the Australian ambassador with information uh, in order to get his signature on a letter that the company then planned to use for whatever purpose they want in the future. Joe Hockey told Four Corners he couldn't recall the letter and would not have acted on it. Documents obtained under FOI show that at the height of the lobbying campaign, senior Australian embassy staff sent more than a dozen emails to key US officials overseeing the sanctions regime. The Australian diplomats met with US State Department and Treasury representatives and raised the importance of an early consideration by the US of an Australian company's proposal to meet the terms of the sanctions. Well, certainly lobbying is, is not new, it's not illegal. Uh, lobbying takes place regularly in Australia. I guess what is interesting with this particular case is the fact that um, efforts were made to actually uh, secure the support of the Australian government to have these uh, sanctions against the company overturned. In 2019, the US lifted sanctions against Rusal after Deripaska agreed to reduce his stake in the company. But Deripaska remains personally sanctioned. The sanctions were controversial and lifting the sanctions were very controversial. There was a lot of discussion in Congress as well as, am as among administration officials about whether the steps taken by EN Plus and Russell were sufficient to remove sanctions on the company since Oleg Deripaska was still such a uh, divisive and controversial figure himself. Last August, the Senate Intelligence Committee stated that Deripaska conducts influence operations, frequently in countries where he has a significant economic interest. The Russian government coordinates with and directs Deripaska on many of his influence operations. Critically, it found that Deripaska's companies, including Rusal, are proxies for the Kremlin, including for Russian government influence efforts, economic measures and diplomatic relations. No individual or company uh, that is sanctioned, as is the case with Mr Deripaska, there are personal sanctions against him, should be allowed to do business in Australia. And equally, no individual or, or company that is accused of serious crime, corruption, money laundering and misconduct should be able to conduct business in Australia. So it's, it's certainly an area where Australia can improve its, its corporate governance, its corporate oversight, to ensure that we uh, have investment in Australia by individuals that are fit and proper to be doing business in Australia. In Russia, Putin is under pressure from his own people. Tens of thousands have clashed with police at protests against the Russian president, demanding the release of opposition leader Alexei Navalny.
Navalny was jailed after surviving a poisoning attempt by Russian agents. At an anti-Putin march in central Sydney, Australian Cossacks and their leader Simeon Boykov turned up to confront the protesters. We're here with our President Vladimir Putin, supporting the President, supporting Vladimir Putin against this opposition scum. The protesters saw Boykov and his cronies as the embodiment of Putin's repressive regime. It's a good representation of people who are for him, so you will see they're all uh, a bit older <laughs> men, like military. I mean, and you see young people happy, smiling and dancing, and we want free Russia. How can you support a regime that has just tried to murder the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny? Look, if it really was them, they have one comment I can make. They should have done it properly. Novichok is very potent, and if it was Novichok, he would be dead. Putin said that if it was them, if someone wanted to kill him, they would have liquidated him. It would be very easy to do so. In fact, he's in jail now, and we can get him in jail. So you support the idea of murdering political opponents? I wouldn't say murdering, I would say liquidating. Murdering is a bad word. Russia will be free! Russia will be free! Around the world, opposition to Vladimir Putin's rule is getting louder. Here in Australia, his loyal supporters are emboldened and growing ever more strident in defending their president and his ruthless regime. Australian laws are very, very relaxed. I could never imagine doing this in other countries, what we're allowed to do here. Australia is a very good place if you want to promote a foreign agenda. My colleagues in Russia, when they hear about what we do here, they're shocked. I mean, you know, we walk through Canberra, middle of Canberra, you know, 30 Cossacks in uniform with a Russian flag marching to Russian military march. And when the Russians in Russia hear about this, they say, could you imagine if, you know, an Australian detachment was to march down Red Square, you know, unauthorized, you know, to a, you know, some American military march or something like that? Impossible. <laughs> but that's what makes Australia unique. <laughs>